Good morning, Coda Territory. We are just a couple of minutes away from uh, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem giving a, uh, her budget address to a joint session of the state legislature. This will be the 135th uh, state budget, uh, which the governor says will be, as always, a balanced budget. Uh, last year, uh, last year, the fiscal 2024, the budget was kind of a, kind of a hefty one. It was uh, $7.4 billion. Uh, almost half of it was federal funding. Uh, you won't see that this year. Uh, the governor, when she was talking about the, uh, the budget about a month ago, she did a newsletter and she said that it was going to be more along the lines of a normal year, uh, which means uh, there won't be a lot of uh, extra funding. We had that because of COVID. And uh, the, the state, if I remember, like I wrote it down, $974 million is what the state did receive in, uh, in uh, American Recovery uh, Act uh, funding. The, the state has about $105 million of that left. And uh, so that's what the legislature will work on. Uh, I'm still monitoring it and taking a look to see when the governor will show up. Uh, it's usually a couple of minutes after. So we can go through a few things. As I said, the $105 million I have left, what is the legislature going to do with it? Well, some people would like to see it go into the water infrastructure. Uh, that's very important. And uh, uh, State Senator uh, Helene Duhamel from Rapid City is one person who was spearheading a campaign to try to uh, get funding for to improve West River water quality and quantity. Uh, she just was a little shy of the vote she needed the last legislative session. Uh, with this $105 million, if the, if the legislature is okay in shifting that into uh, water infrastructure, we might see some of that there. Uh, let's see, as we were talking about it, the state economy, the governor says it's strong, even though she does say we are going to go back to a more normal year. So you won't have a $7.4 billion budget this year. Uh, last year they had surpluses and if you remember there was like a 2% across the board sales tax cut. Uh, it's not quite what the governor wanted. She wanted the food tax cut. She didn't get that, but there was this 2% uh, across the board. The only thing is that is supposed to end, what, 2027, uh, if I remember correctly? And uh, she would like to see that permanent this year. I don't know what she's going to talk about on, on the budget for that. But the biggest thing she says is families. You know, she doesn't want to tax the family, she says. Uh, they want to focus on the needs of the people. And uh, as she said, it's a time to get back to the uh, conservative spending. Uh, doesn't want to raise taxes, so you will not see that. It's uh, whether you see anything cut anywhere, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, the state budget, uh, besides education, which takes up a, a big chunk, you've got uh, funding for for health care and social services that's also quite large and um, also taking care of the, uh, the, the state workers. You've got to pay them. Uh, let's see, right now uh, they're getting ready, uh, reading some uh, statements, but uh, we're not going to go live to that quite yet. We're going to uh, stick with what we have here. Uh, the budget fiscal year 2024, uh, the governor said it, 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 it did fund uh, important uh, K-12 education, health care and state employees, as I said. Uh, also had funding for operations of regional behavior health centers. Oh, uh, the governor is now just coming in there. So let's get this going and we'll see. We'll wait a minute or two before we go full to the the governor. That was so great. I love it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. I see before I even begin my budget address, I need to offer up an amendment 
to add 50 bucks to buy a new gavel for the lieutenant governor. Um, but um, he always keeps things interesting, but that's great. Thank you all for being here. It's my special honor to present to you this year's budget and to see all of your smiling faces back here in Pierre. I want to start with beginning to welcome the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mr. Speaker, members of the House and the Senate for gathering today, and all of my fellow South Dakotans. Up here in the gallery, I have my husband, Brian, who is with us today, and he has brought some special guests with him. He has Pastor Bob, which is who I know him by from Carpenter that came out to see the Capitol for the very first time with the Christmas trees, which I think is incredibly special. We forget sometimes how blessed we are to work in this institution, this historic building, but also the incredible work of the volunteers that work so hard to make it a festive place during the holiday season. Uh, also have Guy and Sherry up there along with the First Lady, Miss Sandy Roden, and my staff and cabinet that are all gathered together as well, who've spent so many hours working on this budget, preparing, and I'm so proud of them and all the work that they have done to run a responsible uh, go state government uh, that is accountable to the taxpayers. And we are grateful to be here to present it to all of you today. Uh, I'd like to take a minute of personal privilege uh, to honor our military that are here. Every time I walk in and I see you in your uniforms, I get overwhelmed with the sacrifices you make for us. So if you would stand, and if all of our veterans would stand so we could honor them, it would mean the world to me if we could do that right now. We live in a world that in many places is in conflict and thank you for always standing in the gap for us to keep and protect our freedoms and our liberties. When most people think about South Dakota, uh, they think about our land, they think about our economy, our assets, and our natural beauty. But when I think about South Dakota, I think about our people. Under God, the people rule. That's not only our state motto, but it's also our way of life. And it's my priority every single day when I come here to work in this building. Today, I am proud to present this budget for your consideration. This budget covers the remainder of fiscal year 2024 and all of fiscal year 2025. It's a budget that prioritizes people and not programs. It's a budget that shows what can be done with smart, conservative fiscal policies. And it's a budget that focuses on our core responsibilities of state government. This year, national inflation has risen. That means that family budgets are tighter and that people have less discretionary money to spend. Every dollar in this budget is an investment in our people. It's money that belongs to them. They know what their needs are, and we're constitutionally required to spend it appropriately to meet their needs. Our number one priority should always be our kids and our grandkids. They're our future. And hopefully, they are the reason why you come here to peer why you take time away from your families, why you take an oath to participate in public service. Every single vote that you take, every dollar that we invest, every policy that you support should be focused on making South Dakota safe, stronger, and healthier for our kids and for our grandkids. Now, our budget must be focused on the core purposes of state government as defined by our state constitution. My budget proposal today focuses on strengthening education, on building a stronger workforce, and on keeping people healthy, investing in long-term infrastructure, avoiding debt so that we can preserve our low-tax, low-regulatory environment that we are incredibly blessed with today. These priorities are possible because of South Dakota's economic strength, our economy is one of the strongest in the nation. Clearly, we are feeling the impact of burdensome regulations from the Biden administration, and inflation has risen. People are still adjusting to the increased cost of everyday goods. We're going to embrace conservative fiscal policies to keep South Dakotans financially secure. We have no individual income tax, no corporate income tax, no personal property tax, strong reserve balances, a AAA credit rating, and one of the only fully funded pensions in the entire country.
This will be our 135th year of delivering a balanced budget. We make it a priority to cut government red tape wherever we can, and we let taxpayers keep as much money in their pockets as possible. South Dakota has reaped the benefits of conservative policies. Even during the recent recessions and the global pandemics, South Dakota has continued to grow. We are the backbone of this country. We have had record surpluses. We've had sales tax revenue that we've been able to use those additional dollars to give back to people. And this year, I am encouraging the legislature to do exactly what families across America are doing every single day, to stick to a tight budget. South Dakota's economy is strong. Now, since I have taken office in 2019, South Dakota has been second in the nation for personal income growth. Incomes have gone up by almost 30% for our people. As we move forward, South Dakota's economy will continue to grow faster than the national average, and our job numbers will continue to grow as well. Our unemployment rate will remain far below other states. Given the success of the Freedom Works Here initiative, we can expect that South Dakota's economy will continue to thrive. People are coming to join our workforce because they believe in what we're doing. They believe in it so much that they want to be a part of it. They want to live and to work in the freest state in America. We have a responsibility to budget accordingly, to extend freedom and opportunity for our kids and for all of those looking to join our way of life. Now, I'm not proposing a conservative spending agenda because our economy is weak. I'm proposing conservative spending because we are strong. And I want South Dakotans to continue to thrive for generations to come. South Dakota's revenues have continued to exceed projections. And we're also projecting $115.6 million in avail available ongoing revenue for the next fiscal year. We also have $208 million in one-time dollars available. This is because our revenues have continued to exceed projections, and my administration has found efficiencies. Before we talk about how we're going to invest those dollars, I want us to have a quick family discussion. Last year, the legislature spent tens of millions of dollars that wasn't in my budget recommendation. Now, clearly, I signed that budget. This year's going to be a little bit different. I'm committed to budgeting conservatively, to spending within our means, returning money to the taxpayers, and focusing on our priorities. I hope that you will agree with me on that approach. Now remember, every interest group has a lobbyist in this Capitol building who wants a piece of this budget during legislative session. It's our job here as elected advocates to be here and to be advocates for the South Dakota taxpayers. The biggest component of our state revenue is sales tax. Our sales tax dollars are running approximately 2.5 million ahead of legislative estimates. Last year, the legislature chose to give the people of South Dakota a sales tax holiday to ease the burden of inflation, which I then signed. It's still meaningful tax relief for people. I'm hopeful that you all will consider making it permanent. A significant portion of our additional revenues comes from unclaimed property receipts, which are now $76 million above estimates. We are treating this as one-time revenue. Over the last 10 years, a typical year brings in between $45 and $55 million in unclaimed property to the state of South Dakota. This amount has dramatically increased. Now, our state, state treasurer, Josh Hader, is looking at what other states spend to market their unclaimed property to help return these dollars back to their rightful owners. He and I are going to be working together to create a plan that ensures that South Dakotans know that their money can be returned to them. Our kids deserve the very best educational opportunities that we can provide. My budget addresses teacher salaries, invests in childhood literacy, and sets our kids up for the careers of the future. Let's talk about the big three. You're all familiar with those. Our schools, our state workers, and our health care providers. National inflation has continued to rise over the past year, and state law requires that we increase funding to education at inflation or 3%, whichever is lower. I am recommending that we go above and beyond that and that we provide 4% increase for education for providers and for state employees.
we have to take care of our people. We have to address our responsibilities first before we consider special interest projects. By investing 4% in our schools, we will give our school districts the money that, that they can pass on then to pay our teachers more. Our teachers are one of the most important factors to setting our kids up for a lifetime of success. We've all seen the impact that a great teacher can have on our kids, on their lives and on their learning. Studies show that just one year with a great teacher can raise a student's earning potential by thousands of dollars a year. It can even increase a student's self-esteem. Great teachers help make that happen. And we can retain great teachers by paying them what they deserve. Every year when we invest in the big three, I advocate that schools put that money directly into teacher salaries. Two years ago, when I requested 6% for the big three, I asked schools to invest 6% into teachers. Last year, when I proposed 7% and you agreed, I said the exact same thing. Unfortunately, teacher salaries have not kept up. Since I took office and with this 4% proposal, we will have increased state funding for our K-12 schools by 26.3%. But actual average teacher salaries have lagged far behind. So I would ask, why would we continue to send money to school administrators and school boards when they don't pass it on to teachers? I'm working with my Secretary of Education, Dr. Graves, to bring some ideas to all of you, to the legislature, about how to bridge this gap. Our teachers do incredible things for our kids. They deserve a paycheck that reflects that. Now I want to discuss a challenge that schools are facing across the country. Literacy rates are dropping dramatically. In fact, schools in cities and states around America and right here in South Dakota are being impacted too. My budget tackles these challenges head on. One of the biggest ways that teachers can help a student succeed is by helping them learn how to read. If a child can read by the time that they're in third grade, they will have a much higher chance to succeed in their lives. Research tells us that there is a better way to teach kids how to read. We're going to trust the science, the science of reading. My Department of Education has launched a statewide literacy initiative based on the science of reading. It includes an emphasis on phonics, which is the best way to teach kids how to read. I am dedicating six million in one-time funds to continue this effort. Let's make sure that our teachers are equipped to deliver this proven model for each of every one of our kids. And if our kids can graduate from high school ready for a college or a career, we can set them up for success. When I first became governor, I decided to make Jobs for America's Graduates, or JAG, a priority because of the proven model of helping at-risk students become better prepared for their future. JAG is working. It helps kids who are at risk of not graduating from high school. Because of the skills that these students learn, 94% of kids who participate in JAG end up graduating. And when I took office, just a very few schools in South Dakota were utilizing JAG. In 2020, we established a full-time facilitator to cooperate with students and schools to set up JAG programs, and today 13 schools across the state have full-fledged programs with students thriving. These kids are completing high school. They're going to college and they're achieving the career of their dreams. So why would we stop at just 13 schools? Today, I'm proposing that we target available federal dollars to invest in JAG. We will expand JAG to more schools. Where we'll set many more kids up for a lifetime of achievement. We educate our kids so that they can learn and they can be successful. We also educate them so that when they can get a good paying job in the career of their dreams, they could do that right here at home too. My proposed budget supports these priorities in several different ways. Now first, we have a very exciting new opportunity for the jobs of the future right here in South Dakota. For too long, our kids were moving out of South Dakota. They were you know, going after exciting technology jobs, and we wanted them to have that opportunity right here at home. We changed it. We made tech research in South Dakota our next big industry. Today, I'm announcing the next step in that effort. 
We will partner with several state universities on a Center for Quantum Information Science and Technology and invest six million in one-time funds to offer unprecedented opportunities for students at Dakota State University, at the School of Mines, SDSU, and USD. Our universities will be on the cutting edge of quantum computing. Now, quantum computing uses the physical properties of subatomic particles to hold a charge. This new field can do exponentially more than a regular computer can do. Imagine a task that it would take regular computers 20 years to accomplish. A quantum computer could handle that task in just a matter of seconds. This center will combine numerous fields to make tremendous advancements in cybersecurity, agriculture, healthcare, and more. South Dakota will be a leader in an emergence, emerging technology, and it's our fastest growing industry. South Dakota is making it a reality. The jobs of the future are not just in cyber and in tech. Our kids need good paying jobs in an exciting variety of different fields. South Dakota has some of the very best tech colleges in America. They're setting our kids up for many career opportunities and I'm proposing 4.8 million in one-time funds for equipment at our technical colleges. This builds on the investments that we have made over the years Mr. Speaker should be happy about this one. We are giving South Dakota students the job training they need on the best and the most up-to-date equipment right here at home. Some of our kids who want to join the careers of our state workforce, they will also be called upon to serve in public service, just like those of you who are here in this chamber. This budget supports our state employees who do so much for the people of South Dakota. They work every single day to make the state safer, stronger, and healthier. My proposal gives a 4% raise to state employees so that we can continue to attract and retain the best and the brightest. If we want our kids and we want to give them the very best opportunities to succeed, we need to set them up for a healthy future. The 4% increase for our providers is an important step to help promote good health for our kids, but also for every South Dakotan at every age and at every stage of life. This increase doesn't pick winners and losers. Inflation is impacting all of our providers, so we should provide them all with relief. Nursing homes will get 4%, Community service providers will get 4%. Developmental disability providers will get 4% as well. All of our providers are critical. I'm sure that you'll have discussions and that you'll have debate throughout the budget process about giving more money to one provider group over another. Some of you might support more money for long-term care or a program that might really help your district or even a tuition freeze at our state universities instead of helping certain provi providers. Last year, we made those types of target adjustments, and we worked hard to make sure that they were covering each of those specialized groups. This year, an equal increase is appropriate because inflation increases are hitting all of our providers. In 2022, we expanded Bright Start to every single corner of the state. Now, this program helps us take care of moms and their babies before they give birth and after. Bright Start provides first-time moms with personal nursing services through pregnancy until their child's second birthday. Since we expanded that program, there has been such high demand for Bright Start that there have been a waiting list in many of our communities. My budget takes advantage of available federal funds to provide this opportunity to more South Dakota moms and their babies, which will reduce and will hopefully eliminate those waiting lists. And every child deserves an opportunity to grow up in a safe and a healthy home. For some, that just isn't possible in the current home that they're in. We must support foster care, guardianships, adoptions for kids who need them. My budget funds additional family treatment foster homes for kids that have more significant emotional or medical needs. We will also provide additional support for families after they choose guardianships or adoptions. I need to touch base on one more aspect of public health. The voters decided in South Dakota uh, that public health will include Medicaid expansion. We will continue to ensure that this program is funded responsibly and that it's run efficiently. 
We still have one more full year of enhanced federal FMAP dollars, which are helping us defer the total cost of what Medicaid expansion is. But in fiscal year 2026, the full need will be about $64 million. Last year, the legislature provided $11.4 million to get us part of the way there. This year, my budget proposes an additional $18.3 million to help cover the costs of the program, and we will need to continue to address these funding issues in the years to come. Every single South Dakotan needs safe roads, bridges, dams, and water infrastructure to live their day-to-day -day lives. We still have about $105 million in remaining federal ARPA dollars from the federal government. As all of you know, we didn't ask for these dollars. The federal government sent them to us. They told us if we sent them back to them, they would be reappropriated to other states to be spent. South Dakota has been more responsible than other states in how we've utilized these dollars. We've worked together to make historic investments in water and wastewater projects. We provided funding for sewer projects attached to workforce housing. We helped expand broadband across every corner of the state. We replaced the life pack devices and ambulances across South Dakota. The legislature also set aside $30 million to administer these grants and these initiatives. The Bureau of Finance and Management has been able to return 25 million of that in cost savings. They facilitated these efforts far more efficiently than what we expected and the Department of Labor is also returning $1 million. With that additional $26 million in available dollars, we have a total of $130.6 million that must be allocated within the next year. Today, I'm going to propose that we appropriate $10 million of those dollars to revenue replacement. That is what is permitted under federal guidance, and I'm recommending that the remaining $120.6 million be invested into various water efforts. The bulk of that money, just over $95 million, will go to the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources water programs, the same as the $600 million two years ago that you're very familiar with. We should also allocate $25 million to state water and to state wastewater projects. It's time to improve our infrastructure by repairing some of our dams as well. I know many of you are familiar with some of the challenges that we face across the state with some of our dams. The Richmond Dam still needs about $20 million in repairs. If we invest $9.7 million in one-time state dollars, school and public lands can leverage FEMA dollars for the rest of it. In similar manner, my budget proposes $2 million to repair the Lake Alvin and Newell Lake Dam. The federal government will provide additional funding to complete this project as well. I'm proposing $7 million in one-time funds to support IT modernization for our state government programs. Our platforms have to keep being invested in in our technology to keep our systems protected. Listen, our state systems are attacked every single day by bad actors, and it is our responsibility to keep our citizens' information safe and secure. Now, by funding all of these infrastructure projects, we avoid having to bond for all those needs. That means that we don't incur debt, the debt that our kids will be responsible for paying off in the future. So I want to give you a quick update on two different projects that are major needs for our state. One of them is the men's prison near Sioux Falls and the women's prison in Rapid City. Now, both of these new modern correctional facilities will keep our community safer, but they will also address the space that we need that we don't have today, space that prevents us from getting those in our custody the help that they need. With these new facilities, we will be able to address behavioral challenges, substance abuse, skills and jobs training, and other areas that these individuals can use to get out of our prisons and get back into society and to thrive. Every dollar that we set aside now for these projects ensures that the state doesn't need to issue debt in the future. Between the past two legislative sessions and my proposal for this year, we will have dedicated more than $650 million to these important projects. This will save our state $600 million in interest and fees over the next 25 years. That's $50 million in savings to the taxpayers every single year.
Setting aside resources now is the fiscally responsible thing to do. Together, we will ensure that our state's long-term economic health for our kids and our grandkids is protected. The new men's prison in Sioux Falls is needed to replace the hill, which was built before South Dakota was even a state. My proposed budget sets aside $228 million in one-time dollars for this project. We do that by utilizing the $95.7 million in reserves above 10%, as well as the remaining $132.4 million in one-time funds. We will place these dollars in the Incarceration Construction Fund to prepare for construction of this new safe facility. And as for the women's prison in Rapid City, we broke ground on the completion of the design phase. However, since we broke ground, we learned that there is a $27 million shortfall to this facility that the space and programming uh, that it needs. We will minimize this need by utilizing federal dollars for water, as well as almost $4 million in remaining land and design dollars. However, that still leaves $21 million outstanding, and I'm proposing that we utilize one-time funds to complete this project. A strong criminal justice system supports our American way of life. It upholds the rights of our people, and that includes the Sixth Amendment right to legal counsel. South Dakota has not guaranteed this right in a very coordinated way in the past. This makes it difficult for courts to obtain qualified and willing attorneys to fill this critical defender role. Chief Justice Jensen initiated a summer task force to analyze our current system and recommend solutions. They found a way to do this better and cheaper. I am recommending that South Dakota create a statewide indigent defense commission that will oversee a statewide appellate defender office to handle criminal appeals, child abuse, neglect appeals, and habeas appeals. This office would also provide training and mentorship to rural attorneys. If we invest $1.4 million in ongoing funding, we will save the counties a net of up to $600,000 a year. Now, to be sure, there are uncertainties in the world today, but I am excited about South Dakota's future. We tackle challenges head on, and we always do it united. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit us, we didn't shut down, and rather we all did the opposite. We invited people to come and enjoy our spaces and our beautiful state. No matter what uncertainties lie ahead, one thing is certain, South Dakota will budget responsibly and conservatively. I want to thank my family. I couldn't do this job without them and their support. And I also want to thank my team at BFM for seeing my vision for this budget, for understanding the importance of focusing on the responsibilities of state government and building a budget from that foundation. They're sitting behind me today. Would you all mind giving Commissioner Jim Terwilliger and his team a round of applause for their fantastic work? Good job, Twigs. I'm excited about this budget proposal. It's a budget that invests in our future, in our kids and our grandkids, the next generation, in their education, future careers, in their health, in infrastructure that helps us avoid debt in the future. This budget proposal makes smart, conservative, common sense decisions. Now, it's not the job of the government to do everything for people. The job of the government is to empower people to do things for themselves. That's the ideal that America was built on. I am proud to present a budget that prioritizes our kids and puts kids first. Under God, the people rule. We do not come to work every day for ourselves. We come to work to serve the people that make this state great. I hope that South Dakota can continue to be a shining example to the rest of the nation. We put people over programs here. They are hardworking people, and the people of South Dakota are strong. They inspire me each and every day. I pray that we can deliver a budget that they can be proud of, a budget that puts them first. So may God bless you, God bless your work, and have a very, very Merry Christmas. Thank you. And there you have it. That is the 135th 
budget address in the state of South Dakota. We're going to hit some of the highlights here, uh, and then we'll, we'll call it quits. Let's see if we get the... Uh, the governor talked about the big three, and, and the, the first of the big three was education. Uh, she said the state usually does 3% on, uh, on, on teacher pay. She wants 4%, not just for education. She also wants 4% for state employees to help them maintain uh, a, a standard of living and also to, to keep the, uh, the state workers and also to recruit more workers. Okay, we're going to uh, go ahead and get out of that. Uh, she was talking about, as I said, 4% for K through 12. Uh, also, uh, a program called JAG. Uh, I wrote that down. Jobs for graduates. Uh, this is a, uh, a program she wants to do using federal funds to, to help keep college graduates in the state. Uh, jobs that they, that they have trained for and have education for. Uh, again, uh, that is uh, uh, one of the education uh, incentives she wants the legislature to approve. Uh, you know, while the governor does set this budget, it's a draft. It goes to the legislature. The legislature is the one that actually decides yay and nay on the purse strings. All right. As we said, uh, health care is also another 4% uh, for health care workers. Uh, and of that $105 million, uh, I think it was 120 the governor was saying, $120 million, not 105 that uh, American Recovery Act funding. Uh, she says that uh, they're going to use a lot of that for the water infrastructure, which is also good. What was interesting uh, to me is a little different is uh, funding for things such as the uh, the men's prison in Sioux Falls and the women's prison in uh, Rapid City uh, to avoid incurring debt by bonding those out. She wants to use one time money, including reserves to pay for those uh, facilities and uh, at the same time keep from incurring more debt. And then obviously you would replenish the reserves later. Uh, we'll see how that, how that pans out and what kind of a reaction we get from the lawmakers on it. Uh, also, uh, an indigent legal defense. She wants a state program set up to, to help uh, indigent people who end up in the court system. Uh, in conclusion, she pretty much says that uh, we're going to keep things uh, as conservative as possible. She called us a conservative spending. Uh, and uh, we will have more on, on this uh, later today. I'll, I'll have something on the website. And uh, our reporter, uh, Umberto Gael Sanchez, is in Pier, and he will be back, and he will be uh, putting stories together for Coda Territory News at 5.30 and 10. And also uh, KEVN Black Hills Fox the six and the nine. And uh, we will see you then. Goodbye. Stream finished, stream finished.